Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If it's too hot for you to handle and far off the beaten track, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. My dear sir, if uh, you're a moviegoer at all, you must know me, Peter Murch, the small, ineffectual man everyone laughs at as soon as he appears on the screen. But uh, there's nothing humorous about my present dilemma. After 30 years, I'm to be starred in my next picture. But unless you can help me, I'll have to say no to this dream of a lifetime. This is hard hard to explain explain in so many words. But if you'll meet me at the Farm Food Vegetarian Restaurant at 1 o'clock today, I'll explain everything. Signed, urgently, Peter Murch. Oh, sure, Brooksy. You know, that gnome-like character from the movies? Oh, Casper Milk Toast himself. That's the guy. The hand-packed little man who puts galoshes over his rubbers when it rains. (laughs) George Valentine, maker of stars. Hey, I wonder how I fit into this picture. Well, I can't wait to find out. Well, then, on to Mr. Murch. Oh, but just one thing, George. Yeah, what's that, Angel? Well, if we have to have lunch at a vegetarian restaurant, could we stop off for a a hamburger first? Veggie burgers. I insist we have veggie burgers for lunch. Veggie burgers? Yes, indeed, Miss Brooks. And if I didn't tell you, you wouldn't know they were made of nuts and choice legumes. Peas, beans... Uh, Yeah, I'm sure they're going to be real tasty. But uh, what about your letter? What's on your mind, Mr. Murch? Oh, dear. I knew that letter would sound confusing. To say the least. You see, Mr. Valentine, I had a long talk with my psychoanalyst. And you know what? What? I'm uh, schizophrenic. Oh, no. I'm not one person, I'm two. Battling furiously with each other. Who's winning? I'm not really that mild, retiring little man that millions of people know. No. There's another side of me that craves excitement. Even violence. Oh, now, wait a minute, Mr. Murch. But it's quite true, young man. My psychoanalyst tells me I just can't go on being a house divided. No. I simply must involve myself in some kind of uh, exciting adventure. Well, what does your doctor expect you to do? Go out and kiss the first beautiful blonde you see on the street? Uh, Oh, no, no, no. I'm serious, Mr. Valentine. Look at me. Practically a nervous wreck. I simply can't go on being the prim Peter Murch my public expects of me. When the director says, lights, camera... I begin to shake. That's the other side of me coming out. Oh, that's bad. Yes, I break into a cold sweat. I I feel like screaming right out there in front of everybody. Well, maybe all you need is a good scream. Oh, no, it isn't that simple. My psychoanalyst says I've been playing the timid soul in my personal life as well as on the screen. And it's affecting me. Anyway, I can't go into this new picture. Oh, but Mr. Murch, you've worked so hard all these years. And this is your first starring role. And it would be my first failure, too, in my mental condition. And uh, you want me to provide the excitement? Yes, Mr. Valentine. Uh, Perhaps introduce me to some low, disreputable characters. Uh, Take me to places where almost anything can happen, you know. You really think that would help? Well, my psychoanalyst seems to think so. Uh, You will help me, won't you, Mr. Valentine? Well, uh... I'll pay your regular fee and whatever expenses we incur. Uh, Well, okay, it's a deal. We'll see what forms of mild excitement we can find for you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Valentine. I'll be grateful to you as long as I live. Uh, Can we start now? Oh, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have to make some plans. Uh, What about 8 o'clock tonight? You see, I usually don't go out hunting excitement, Mr. Murch. As a rule, it just happens. Oh, no, George. You're not going to take poor Mr. Murch to Mark Logan's grotto. Well, he wants excitement. Yeah, but not that low dive. He'll faint as soon as he gets in the door. Oh, darling, Mark Logan is a respectable citizen these days. He's gone straight. Yeah, in a crooked sort of way. He's running a genteel pool parlor and so-called grill. And if a fight breaks out now and then, you can't blame Mark. Try and hit me with a pool cue, are you? Ah, you had a comedy. I seen you move that number seven ball when you thought I wasn't looking. Why are you... Oh, 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 Mr. Valentine. Oh, my goodness. This will show you. Well, hey, you are, Mr. Murch. Life in the raw. Oh, my, this is exciting. 
third brawl in one hour. Just what the doctor ordered. Okay, let that mug get up or beat his brains in. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll tell you, Pat. Come on now, you two lugs. Break it up and get back to your game. I'm running a respectable joint here. Not yet, Logan. Not before I split his skull with his chair. Oh, 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 oh my goodness. Oh, another inch, oh, Mr. The merchant, that chair would have parted your head. Yeah, and permanently. Okay, beat it, both of you. Finish it out in the alley. All right, Logan, it won't take me long. I'll make it look like a pot of hamburger, brother. And I'll sure it. <laughs> you gotta excuse him, Mr. Valentine. The boys get kind of playful once in a while. Oh, sure, Mr. Logan. And you lose more pool cues that way. Oh, uh, Mr. Merch, we'd better get out of here before things really get rough. Oh, I wouldn't think of it for a moment. I- I'm just beginning to feel better. Oh... Uh, Mr. Murch. Yes, Mr. Valentine. Here's a nickel. Well, thank you. Why don't you get something on the jukebox over there? I, uh, I want to talk to Mr. Logan a minute. Oh, this is so exciting. Evening after the week. Don't pay no attention to them numbers, Mr. Murch. Wherever you put your nickel, all you get is Mother McCree. That's my favorite. George, I'm afraid we've underestimated our timid soul. He can't get enough. Yeah, and you certainly did your best, Logan. Yeah, which brings up a point, Mr. Valentine. I don't want to be mercenary or nothing like that. Yeah. But there's a question of money. Joe and Alex just now almost killed themselves. There's the mother two fights we framed up. <laughs> okay, Logan. Hey, uh, this ought to take care of the boys. Yeah, thanks. Say, if I knew you was willing to pay this much, I could have fixed up something real messy for the old boy. Oh, that song. Ain't it beautiful? Mother McCree. Yeah, sure. Got any other ideas for excitement, Logan? Well, that little guy don't scare easy. Now, wait. How about this? When you people leave the joint, I'll get the boys to drive up in a big black sedan. Yeah? They grab the little guy and take him out in the country for a spell. (laughs) You mean kidnap him? (laughs) Oh, I wouldn't put it that way, Miss Brooks. They lock him in a cellar for a couple of days, keep him tied up. Ain't gonna hurt him, huh? Hey, hold it, Logan. That's going a little too far. Yeah. Eh, I've got an idea. Yeah. And I think it'll work, too. What's that? Here's what you do. You take Mr. Murch out to the Seaside Amusement Park. Oh, after this, a ride on the Ferris wheel is going to leave him cold. Oh, it's nothing like that. You're going to take him through the Tunnel of Love. Oh, Mr. Logan, I'll admit you can find a certain kind of excitement in the Tunnel of Love. But I doubt if Peter Murch is my type. Uh, He was talking to me, Brooksy. He's not your type either. What I was thinking, Mr. Valentine, is uh, I happen to know the guy who runs the Tunnel of Love. His name is Len Dimmick. Oh, goody, George. Maybe we can get a special discount. What I mean is I'll call up Len and have him take the trip through the tunnel with you, personal. He's one of them practical jokers, so he'll play along with the gig. Now, dream up a couple of stunts. Leave it to Len to find a way to scare the pants off you, Mr. Murch. Well, it's worth a try, Logan, and the night's getting shorter. I gotta earn my fee. If you want to get out of that amusement park quick, better take Walton Boulevard. They're tearing up Grayson Avenue. Okay, thanks a lot, Logan. Oh, Mr. Murch. Hmm? Yes, Mr. Valentine? Uh, if you can drag yourself away from Mother McCree, we'd like you to join us in a blood-curdling journey through the Tunnel of Love. Oh, just think of it. The three of us, alone, together. This should be real exciting. Nice racket you got here, Demick. Selling five minutes worth of darkness. Darkness is a valuable commodity, Mr. Valentine. It... it is? Yeah. Just like I was telling Mr. Murch here. Well, after all those gruesome things you've been telling us, I I don't think I want to hear any more. Well, thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr. Murch. Demick is right. Now, could you find a cozier place for a murder than a tunnel of love? Yeah, that reminds me. I remember a happy couple who took a ride through here just for a little innocent smoochie. And then... Yes? Suddenly, death struck. A silent... Cruel blow. I, uh, I wish we had some light in here. What? In the Tunnel of Love? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember that, Timmy. It was an unsolved crime, wasn't it? Often wondered how the poor man was killed and how the young lady felt when she heard him scream. Here, in the darkness. <laughs> oh, oh, Mr. Timmy. What was that? Oh, one of the many voices of darkness that echoed through the tunnel of love. Just calm yourself, Mr. Murch. Well, 
I wasn't really frightened at all, Mr. Valentine. Uh-huh. You're a brave man, Mr. Murch. Nobody knows what the next step into the darkness may lead to. Nobody knows... Oh. Mr. Deming. <laughs> I think our friend missed his profession. He should have been an actor. Mr. Valentine. Mr. Dimmick, I... I think he's fainted. Huh? Fainted? And his hair. Uh, I think it's blood. Oh, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, Wait. My... My head. Let me get to my, it. George, he's not fainted. My head. I'll light a match. Uh, look at him. We've got to get him out of here. Get him to a hospital. Uh, in... In my... my he, he's trying to say my, something to you, Mr. Valentine. What is it, Demick? What is it? What are you trying to say? He... In my pocket. Oh. Transfer. Yeah, yeah. Take it. Bus. Transfer. Hold on. Huh? We'll get a doctor, Mr. Demick. He'll take care of you. Here, strike another match, will you, Mr. Murch? Yes, he, he, he can't guess. Uh-huh. Yeah, I don't think... Timmy has much use for a doctor now, Brooksy. George. But, Mr. Valentine, this can't be true. Why, the things like this simply don't happen. I'm afraid this is an exception to the rule, Mr. Murch. Timmy's been murdered. We'll return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about how to be kind to your starter. It's often the little things that make your day a good one or a rough one. The simple business of starting your car, for example. If it's obstinate and gives you a bad time when you want to get going, it can add up to a lot of irritation. For fast starts every time, and wherever you're driving, just try Chevron Supreme gasoline in your car. This premium quality gasoline is climate-tailored, specially adapted to each different climate and altitude zone in the West. Day or night, summer or winter, you can depend upon it for fast starts. And that's a saving, too, of the power in your battery. What's more, Chevron Supreme gives your car smooth acceleration and extra power for rugged hills. Get a tank full tomorrow at any standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, here's the situation. You take on a cockeyed job because that happens to be your business. A character actor wants you to provide him with some excitement because his psychoanalyst told him he's been playing the meek, timid type so long it's beginning to affect his work. So you give Peter Murch a ride for his money, including a ride through the tunnel of love in an amusement park. And then... Murder strikes in the darkness. Valentine? Yeah, Lieutenant Riley. Usually people manage to get killed in bed, in their home, or on the street. But Dimmick gets murdered in his own tunnel of love. And you're right there with him. Oh, I know it sounds fantastic, Lieutenant. But believe me, we were just trying to introduce a little excitement into Mr. Murch's life. That's right. <laughs> it was all very innocent. Ah. Oh, well, how was George to know anything like this would happen? Miss Brooks, I'm just a public servant. I get paid a reasonable sum each month to maintain law and order. And I don't like it when somebody gets paid to promote pool room brawls and instigate other forms of public disturbance. All right, stop quoting the police manual, Lieutenant. Yeah. Whatever happened here tonight would have happened whether I was in on this deal or not. It's just... Just that my psychoanalyst Mr. said... Mr. Murch, uh, why don't you go somewhere and have a nice, quiet, nervous breakdown? Well, my psychoanalyst... When I'm through here, I'll come and join you. Uh, murder in the tunnel of love. Oh, Lieutenant. Yes, Brennan. The doc just got through with Dimmick. Skull fracture. Blunt instrument. All right, I'll be right there. Uh, tell the boys to get some lights set up in that tunnel. We're going to go over it inch by inch. Yes, sir. Now, Valentine, I suppose you're going to go home to your nice warm bed. Oh, well, I'll be glad to stick around, give you a hand. No, 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 thanks, thanks. I've got enough trouble. But I want to see you the first thing in the morning in my office. Sure. And you too, Miss Brooks. Yes, sir. And Mr. Murch. Uh, Yeah, yes? It uh, might give you a little extra excitement to see the inside of a police station. So be there at nine sharp. But looks like we're not wanted around here, so uh, come on, Mr. Murch. I still think I ought to drop you off at your hotel, Mr. Murch. Yes, you've had enough for one night. Well, uh, my wife and I are staying at the Fenmore right here on Grayson Avenue. But I can tell, Mr. Valentine, you're not just giving up this case like that. Oh, no. 
You're up to something, aren't you? Well, well, yeah, you stirred up a hornet's nest somehow or other, and I want to see what it's all about. And I'm going to be right there with you. Oh, hey, no, no, wait. No, 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 there's no use arguing. George? Yeah, Brooksy? Well, that part of a bus transfer Dimmick wanted you to have, what do you make of it? I don't know yet. Well, why should anyone keep a piece of old transfer? Now, that's probably one of the most worthless things in the world. And only a third of a transfer at that. Yet that man insisted that you have it with his dying breath. Must mean something. Yeah, well, we'll see what the lieutenant makes out of it. I gave it to him. Told him what Dimmick said. But you've made something out of it already, haven't you, Doc? Come on, let's have it. Uh, well, as a matter of fact, you can, you can tell a lot from a bus transfer, Brooksy. Even a third of a one, if you look at it real careful like. Meaning what? That it was issued by the Orange Bus Company, route number 411. And the little punch holes, one for the year, one for the month, and even the day and the hours during which it was good. You, you noticed all those things? That transfer was issued July 29th, 1943, between the hours of 4 and 6 p.m. All of which still means nothing to me. Nor me either at this point. But I have an idea that late Mr. Dimmick meant it to provide free transportation for his murderer to the end of the line. Hey, why are we turning off, George? Where are we going? <laughs> hey, you know something, Brooksy? Riley and I don't always agree, but he knows his business, and so do his boys. We're going down to police headquarters. Well, what for, Mr. Valentine? The police don't miss much. And when they do, they make a record of it so they'll never forget. And that's where we're headed, Mr. Murch. The Department of Unsolved Crimes. Oh, it's you, Valentine. Yeah, and this time I brought you a container of coffee, Dawson. Thought you'd need it. Well, the sleepier we can get down in this department, the better we like it. <laughs> Who are your friends? Oh, my assistant, Miss Brooks and Mr. Murch. Uh, how do you do? What do you want, Valentine? You know these files aren't open to the public. Well, I'm not just the public, Dawson. Uh, your boss, Riley, told me to be down here tomorrow morning and be sure I had the right information. He said that? Oh, yeah, sure, go on. Call him up, check for yourself. Oh, no, as long as he said so. What do you want to know? If there were any unsolved crimes on July 29th, 1943. July 43, let's see... Oh, it's that file in the corner near the window. Okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, what are you looking for, Mr. Valentine? The murderer, I hope. You and I ought to be used to being left in the dark, Mr. Murch. I see. Yeah, July 1943. See, we got in this folder. Stolen car, front of Grant and Company, burglary, and... Yes? And on July 29th, 5.35 p.m., $200,000 jewel robbery at Smith and Allenby Jewelers on 5th Street. The date on the transfer. Uh -huh. And that picture, that's our Mr. Dimmick. Leonard Dimmick, 38, clerk at Smith and Allenby's. No suspicion of collusion and holdup. But Dimmick was operating a tunnel of love. A lot of things can happen in a man's life in five years, Brooksy. Let's see that, George. No getaway car used in robbery as far as known. Passerby observed man in gray suit carrying briefcase board orange bus... Outside jewelry store almost immediately after holdup. Witness positive man was running from store. Oh, dear me. This is just too much for me. Traced bus driver number 602, but no information on man in gray suit. Well, that's that, kids. Now we've really got to work fast. What's the rush, George? If we don't move fast, Brooksy, there's going to be another murder. Mr. Valentine, as I told you, this is the busiest time of the day for us here at the depot. You know, getting the buses out on schedule. Yeah, I, I understand, Mr. Eldridge. But look, this is very important. Who was your bus driver, number 602, on July 29th, 1943? Oh, very well. If you can't wait, I'll look it up for you. You see, uh, we have a file here on every man who ever worked for us. Uh-huh. 44, 43, July the 29th. Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah? Yeah, number 602. It was, uh, it was Bob Gray. Still work for you? Oh, yeah, Bob's still with us. As a matter of fact, he's one of our steadiest men. There's nothing wrong, is there? I don't know yet. Well, where can I get hold of Mr. Graves? Why, well, I, uh, I don't know. This is day off. All right, what's his address? Come on, come on. Uh, 1411 Dever Street. One four one one. Looks like a rooming house. Yeah, with the inevitable sign. No room. Uh. Take these steps a little slower, please. Oh, Mr. Murch, I almost forgot about you. Well, I, I'm not just as young as I used to be. Who is? <laughs> but right now, I'm interested in seeing that someone else has a chance to grow a little older. Wait a minute, George. There's a name here under this bell. What does it say? Uh, 
Bob Gray. That's our man. But the, who is Bob Gray? An honest toiler, Mr. Murch. To be more specific, a bus driver. To be more specific, bus driver number 602, who had a very busy day, July 29th, 1943. Yeah? Who is it? A friend of yours sent me over to talk to you, Graves. Go on, beat it. Get out of here. Okay, Bob. But Len Dimmick wouldn't like the way you treat me. What'd you say? Who are you? There's nothing much I can say with that gun stuck in my midriff. Never mind that. Who are these two? Just friends. What do you say we go inside and close the door? It'll be much easier that way. Okay. But well, what's this about Dimmick? Come on, come on, talk. I wish he wouldn't keep pointing that gun. It, it makes me nervous. <sighs> nothing like excitement, is there, Mr. Murch? Look, mister, you said something about Dimmick. What about him? He's dead. He's... So what? You bringing me an invitation to his funeral? No. I'm just trying to postpone your funeral. What's that supposed to mean? Just this, listen. You're going to have a visitor any time now. I'm surprised he hasn't shown up before. I still say what's that supposed to mean? All right, friend, if that's your attitude. And I thought you had to have some brains to be a bus driver. How do you know so much about me? And being a bus driver, you should appreciate the value of a transfer. Even a piece of a transfer. Transfer? That's right. All right, spill it. And remember, I got this gun in your gut. George, be careful. Don't worry, Brooks. He's much too curious to shoot. Yes, but that gun may go off a- accidentally. Who's that? Did you bring the cops? I didn't bring anybody. That's your visitor. What? Cool down your trigger finger and listen to me. What's this all about? Are you a cop? I'm strictly on my own. But if I'm right, whoever's knocking on that door is here to kill you. I'm not kidding now. Well... And no one knows it better than you. You gonna do as I tell you? Oh. All right. Brooksy, you and Mr. Murch get over there in that corner. Away from the door. Make it snappy. Yes, George. Come on, Mr. Murch. Now, Graves, open up. Try to be natural. Put that gun away. Yeah, yeah. I'll be standing right here in back of the door. <laughs> well, Graves, I was beginning to think you were out. Ah, uh, you know how it is, Logan. My day off. I guess I fell asleep. Awful thing happened to Len Dimmick, didn't it? Yeah, I heard about it. Come inside, huh? And just when we were going to split everything three ways. Yeah, that's right. That makes the gravy all the richer for you and me, don't it? I don't get it. And if there was only one, there'd be nothing but gravy left. What are you talking about? You want me to interpret? Valentine, you... What Logan means, Graves, is he was going to kill you just as he killed Dimmick. Uh, you're out of your mind. Maybe, but you killed Len Dimmick. When I heard about Len, I thought it was something like that. Don't listen to him, Bob. You were just too clumsy about it, Logan. I took Grayson Avenue coming back. It wasn't torn up at all the way you said. So what? You sent us the long way so you could get to the Tunnel of Love before us. That's right, George. And he'd be the only one to know that Dimmick would be inside the Tunnel of Love with us. He arranged the whole thing. Oh, my goodness. You sneaked into the Tunnel before us, Logan. You were waiting on the platform for the boat to pass. Yeah, but in, in the darkness, it could, it could have been me. I could have had my head bashed in. I, I don't think I feel so good. No, it wouldn't have been you, Mr. Murch. Len Dimmick was doing all the talking. Made himself the perfect target. Graves, you're not going to believe this guy, are you? Yeah, I believe him. You killed Len and you came here to kill me so you could have all the gravy you was talking about. Put that gun down, Bob. Put it down. Double cross me, will you? Yeah, let me have that, Graves. You got a big enough rap against you now. George, let go. He, he shot Mr. Logan. And the first one who moves will get what he got. I'm getting off. Stay where you are. Drop that gun. Huh? I said drop it. That's better. Oh, oh Lieutenant Ryan. Glad to see you, Lieutenant. Lieutenant. Sergeant Dawson called and said you were snooping around the unsolved crimes department, so I had you tailed. Oh, uh, who's this guy on the floor here? How bad's he hurt? My, my arm. He should have blown your head off. Brennan, get this man out of here into a hospital, whoever he is. That's Mark Logan, Lieutenant. Ex-con. Now runs a pool parlor. Now, what's this all about? Well, Logan's one end of a triangle. Len Dimmick, former jewelry clerk, was the second. And Graves here, bus driver, is the third. They're the trio who waltzed through that Smith and Allenby job back in 43. How do you know all of this, Valentine? Lieutenant, I think that if you go through Logan's clothes when he gets to the hospital, you'll find a third of a bus transfer on him. Wouldn't you say so, Graves? I, uh... Ah, uh, why not? Sure, we pulled that job, the three of us. Dimmick, Logan, and me. We decided to wait five years because the jewels were too hot to touch right away. Where are they now? Buried under the water in the tunnel of love. But uh, those t- transfers... Yes, what about them? Uh, lots of things can happen in five years. Guy can die, get put in jail. So we decided whoever showed up with a third of the transfer from my bus would get his share. Valentine, how did you stumble onto Graves? Well, Lieutenant, why a third of a transfer? Why not a quarter or a half? I knew about Dimmick and Logan. That makes two. But there was still one more to account for. I get it, and it had to be the bus driver. That's right, Brooksy. They wouldn't leave their getaway to chance. And they were sure the bus would be right there at the exact minute. 
Well, I'll be... Almost $70,000 for a third of an old transfer. No wonder Logan was willing to go to all that trouble to get rid of Dimmick and Graves. Well, is that enough excitement for you, Mr. Murch? Mr. Murch! What's the matter, Brooks? He... he's fainted. Well, here we are, Mr. Murch. Feeling better? Here's your hotel, Mr. Murch. <laughs> I, I don't know what you think about me painting like that, but I really do feel like a new man. My psychoanalyst was so right. Think you're up to playing that star role now? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, now that I'm convinced I'm the swaggering, masterful type at heart. Good for you, Mr. Murch. Oh, uh, mm, well, just one thing. Yes? Would uh, mm. you two mind coming upstairs with me? But why? I, I stayed out so much later than I promised. Oh, hmm? You see, Mrs. Murch is such a forceful personality. If you're planning a motoring trip, here's something you should do to make it a safe trip. Stop in at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station before you start out and have your tires inspected. If you find they're worn smooth, have risky cuts or bruises, don't take a chance. Play safe and get a new set of grip-safe Atlas tires. The wider, skid-resisting Atlas tread gives you greater driving protection. There's more rubber to grip the road to give you quick, safe stops and absorb road shocks. With each new Atlas passenger tire, you get a full year's written warranty against damage to the tire from road hazards. No wonder Atlas is the tire known nationally for its safety, long life, and economy. Another tip, when you're on the open road, keep safe by keeping the right amount of air in each tire. And that's a job for the folks at independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear Lieutenant Riley saying, Look, Miss Brooks, my feet hurt. Let's get back to the house. Oh, hmm? please, Lieutenant. George and Marta have been away so long, I'm really worried. Let's take one look up here in the lemon grove. Well, all right. Wait till I put the flashlight on. Look. Over there. Valentine. George. Oh. Hello, everybody. I was just thinking of getting up anyway. Oh. Somebody must have been staging an atomic test around here. Hey, where's Marta? Here's your answer, Valentine. She's right over here, but uh, no hurry. She couldn't move if she tried. Tonight's adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Louis Van Ruten as Mr. Murch, Joe Duvall as Logan, Paul Fries as Dimmick, Barney Phillips as Graves, and Dick Ryan as the manager. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.